I don't care what kind of car you're into or what your level of experience is. You're going to learn something you can use from this video. I'll make sure of that. Um, we shot a video last week, the other day, uh, about the value of a car, right? How, you know, a, a car can be viewed from different levels of monetary worth. You know, it's what is it? Actually, you know what? Just put a link to it here and you can go watch that video. So I made the statement, this was a 1974 Duster, and I made the statement in the, in the video that this car, to me, was worth between twelve dollars and $15,000 in parts. And then I could break it down and get that money back in about three months. And, you know, now a lot of you guys understood what I was saying. You've already been in this, in this world of, of, you know, dealing in car parts. So you can relate, you knew. But a lot of people were very skeptical. And especially because one of the things I did in this video was I ran, because now for the sake of being, you know, brief, right, because we, we don't want to drag this on for days, I just went through the car real quick and I says, okay, this part is worth this much, this part is worth this much, this part is worth this much. And the car was sitting on a trailer and obviously I didn't get into the nuts and bolts of it. And the bolts of it, like, to understand what I'm talking about, this bolt, I'm going to keep going back to this particular bolt and I'll explain that in a, in a, in a few minutes. So, like I said, for the sake of being brief, I just ran through real quick and threw dollar values at what I could see on the, you know, on the car. Needless to say, there's a lot more to a car than what's just sitting, you know, on the surface. Breaking it down, there are tens of thousands of parts, you know, little intricate little doodads and clips and brackets and specialty fasteners like this particular one right here spread all through the car. And each one of those things has a value. But now, how do you go ahead and market that? How do you, you know, take a car that's got all of these thousands of parts and efficiently, so you're not spending your whole life doing it, efficiently put them into the market and turn them into cash in your pocket and fund your projects? So I'm going to show you how, how step by step, I'm going to show you how I established a parts business, how, how, how to position yourself to where you can do this efficiently, you know, how to set up the business and be able to run something like that out of, you know, a, a, what we did it out, we started the business here in, in a suburban subdivision, just using the shed and the garage, and then eventually expanded it to where we had a lot where we were, you know, doing our cars. So we're going to go step by step, and the first thing let's do is let's go to a lot, and I'll show you ground zero and, and some examples of how you turn these things into, you know, how to view the parts, how to view the pieces. Uh, as per their, you know, their value. So let's go over there now. So first things first, if you're the average guy working with average means, the shotgun approach to selling parts will not work. It'll lead to chaos, confusion, tons of inventory that you're not going to be able to move. You have to target your audience. You have to target a specific type of car. So for me, it was Mopars. And I narrowed it down even further and made it A-body Mopars. Why did I choose that? Because they were produced for a, a very long period of time. The number of parts that are interchangeable between, let's say, a 1960 Valiant and a 1976 Duster, you would be amazed at how many little things are completely interchangeable. I picked those because they're popular. There's people all over the world who are building them, restoring them, racing them, you know. And because I had access to a lot of uh, raw material. I had access to a lot of parts cars. I had access to a lot of people who had accumulated parts. The shotgun approach, when you take the shotgun approach, you miss stuff like this bolt. So this bolt right here, what this is, this is a fuel pump bolt that they used on pretty much every classic era Mopar from like 1960 to the 1980s. It's a special bolt. It's unlike any other. Uh, meaning that it has, it doesn't, usually these bolts have like a, a, a captured washer on them, but this bolt has the washer actually built into the head. And they were only used to mount the fuel pumps and only used during that period of time. Now, if you don't know the cars, very specifically those cars and the pieces that make them up, you won't know about this. But somebody restoring a car, looking for that exact bolt, what choices do they have? You can't run to the hardware store and buy this. Nobody reproduces them. You need to find somebody who deals in specifically that type of car. So that's just a good example. Um, now, you obviously, you need a place to do it, and you've got to be creative with your place. 
This lot here, we use this now to store our project cars, you know, while they're in rotation and waiting for things to be done. But originally, I scored this lot specifically to part out cars. It'll hold eight cars, and generally I would have six or seven of them back here at a time. And they would all be A-body Mopars, 1960 to 1976 A-body Mopars. Uh, it's in an industrial part of town, as you can hear the stuff going on behind us, the compressors, and you'll often, you'll often hear like ambulance sirens and everything. That's because like we're in like the place that nobody wants to be. And this particular lot wasn't even available. It was just a space behind some storage buildings. And I made the owner of the property an offer, uh, you know, a couple hundred dollars a month. And he jumped at it because this was completely useless property. I could be back here all day, all night, hammering, grinding, making all kinds of chaos nobody cared nobody didn't bother anybody so location is important but you don't need a huge location this one here is 75 foot long by 80 by uh, 20 foot wide <coughs> now when you go to part out a car here's the philosophy i always took when i started when i started to part the car i treated my parts cars the way the indians treated a buffalo okay the car was sacred, and it was my responsibility to make sure that every little bit of that car got used. It, it, if, I did, if I couldn't sell it, I would give it away, or I would incorporate it into one of my own projects. So it wasn't that I was just willy-nilly and grabbing cars off the street and ripping them apart. No, I, I took each one as its own sacred entity, and I recognized every single part on the car. And that's one of the reasons why I was able to be successful with this because you know I it, it wasn't just going for the quick easy pickings you know I knew and here come over here here's an example you guys have got to excuse the mess this was a 1970 dart that started in pretty much the same condition as that duster that was on the trailer you know it was a it was a it was a roached car there was nothing to it and we break I've broken this thing down to okay so here's what's left of this and you say, well, what's here? What can I sell off of this? Where's the money in this? You know, if you know the cars and you know the market, you'll know that it's very common for rocker sections to ride out. Here's a perfect rocker section. Here's $60 to somebody. These door jams crack, right? This section right here is worth between 40 and 60 bucks to somebody. These uh, rear window regulators, they have trouble prone rollers the rollers on this are in good shape each of these rollers is worth ten dollars to somebody the actual window crank itself the crank mechanism is worth 30 bucks to somebody so let's say you buy a car and it's it's a rust bucket okay it has rotted frame rails the frame rails are junk right no only parts of the frame rails are junk for example on this car we had somebody who only needed the back section of frame rail so we sold in this back section of frame rail. Somewhere along the line, you'll get a guy who needs the front section of frame rail. So they sell reproduction frame rails, and they're about $400 plus shipping. I was selling complete frame rails for $175 each plus shipping, and they were flying. And I'm going to show you how to price stuff too a little bit later on. Uh, but even a frame rail that's got a rotted back section or a rotted front section or a kink in the middle can be broken down. So this section of frame rail right here is worth 75 bucks to somebody who doesn't want to spend $400 on a reproduction. This section here, a car that's been in, a, in, a, in an accident where this is crinkled or this is worth another 60 bucks. This back section over here, which is commonly rotted, that's worth about 75 bucks. So even a frame rail, that's, that's shot, that's like, you know, oh, this is junk, it's, it's, you know, no, it's not. This is all worth something. Some people will have it rotted inner wheel houses. Here's another 50 or $60 to somebody who's trying to, you know, either fix a rotted wheelhouse, or even better than that. You have a lot of guys who are taking what used to be a race car, or, you know, a street machine, and restoring them. So a car that's been mini tub, let's just say, this person who wants to restore back the stock needs this section. I'll pay a hundred bucks for this, no problem. Um, the same thing goes with things like, for instance, um, to roll this over. You'll see that this car has the brackets to mount the back seat. 
Well, over the last 50 years that these cars have been played with, how many of them had the back seat removed and these brackets cut off? Now, if you're restoring a car like that to street use, you need this bracket. It's not reproduced. You'll gladly pay 20 or 30 bucks for that bracket. All in all, if you take this section of the car, there's still several hundred dollars worth of trinkets and odds and ends on this section right here that people need. You just need to find those people. And I'm going to show you how to do that. So this was my most valuable tool. When I started selling parts, right, here's what, here's, I, I guess I lucked into a lot of it, but you know, luck is when preparation meets opportunity. So here's what happened. It was about 11 years ago that I started getting into the business and I had parted a car or two, made a couple of dollars, and then I started looking for bigger loads of parts. So at that period of time, it was a, it was a technological transition uh, from people who were taking parts to swap meets and selling them, you know, out of their houses and, and, you know, like the local thing. And it had evolved into like eBay land. At the time, eBay was hot, right? So the older guys at that time who had accumulated all of these parts, the swap meet market dried up, the, the, the walk by, you know, the, the drop in market dried up and they had all of these parts. They had no way to sell them. They weren't computer savvy. So I was able to go on by, you know, whole garages, sheds, storage units full of parts for like what would be like 10 cents on the dollar. And these guys were grateful to get rid of this stuff because it had become a burden to them. At that time, I was selling on eBay and eBay had started to slow down a little bit. They had just gone with the whole, you had to have PayPal and all that. And that took a huge chunk out of it. And at the same time, the, uh, they started, like, you know, bombing the ads, so, you know, so they have, you know, uh, like the, the manufacturers would just run like a hundred ads for, you know, a, a product. And, it, and it, it just, it just killed eBay. I started selling off a of Craigslist. And while I was selling off a of Craigslist, and Craigslist was hot at the time, it's not anymore, but it was hot at the time, uh, I started looking for like other ways, other avenues. And I came across a forum that was specifically dedicated, and this isn't an ad for these guys, but I should do an ad for them because I made a good living off of them for you know, 10 years. I found a forum called Fabo, for everybody's only, that only sold A-Body Mopar stuff. Well, right away I started running ads on there. Uh, it took me a little while to get a feel for the market and a feel for pricing and, and, and the flow of things, but I started running ads on there and I was moving inventory like crazy. Now, it wasn't something that was just done casually, right? I took you know, a, a hardcore approach to this business. I would run an ad and I would check that ad, no exaggeration, every half hour, right? Every 45 minutes, because I didn't want to take a chance on a customer you know, responding to the ad and I don't get back to them right away, so you know, they'll move on to the next guy. I was on it like crazy. Um, I would take, and, and I used to get, I used to get like, you know, uh, 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 they used to get mad at me because I would run like 60 ads at a time and a lot of guys were like, you know, he's, he's taking over, he's bombing a place. So I learned to taper that back and learn the, you know, the, the, the rhythm so as to not piss people off. But I was on it. I would take a parts car in. I would, I would first sell the easy exterior parts, you know, trim, lights, bumpers, whatever it would happen to be, and then I would move further and further into the car until I had, you know, I was dealing in the mechanical end of it, you know, or, or the, you know, chassis pieces and so on and so forth. And on average, once I actually had this down to a science, uh, it would take me approximately three months. There were some cars that I would, I would sit on literally, you know, I could sit on for two years, you know, like a, like a, a 66 four-door Valiant that hung around forever, I couldn't, I, you know, but little by little, pieces did sell off that car. And then there were other cars, like for instance, I took a, uh, I bought a, uh, a 70 Valiant, uh, 70 Duster, uh, that was just a roller, you know, no motor, no trans, no, nothing like that. And I bought this thing uh, off the Atlanta Craigslist. I paid, I think it was $600 for it, and, uh, that car, over the course of three months, I literally, it was, because it was like a rust-free car, I literally reduced it down to zero. There was nothing left. I, I mean, like, when I say nothing left, I mean, where that car was, when I was finished with it, there was nothing. I sold every single scrap off that car. So, you have to be on it. It's not something you can do casually. It's not something you can just sell on women and say, oh, well, I'll just sell some parts. You 
really have to dedicate yourself. You really have to focus. And most importantly, you need to know those specific cars. Like I said, for me it was Mopar. For you it could be anything. It doesn't make any difference. But you need to know and study the details. And pricing is important too. So let me tell you what I did with pricing, okay? Let's just say, for example, I had a, a, a grill, right, a 69 dark grill. I would scour the internet and I would find low prices and high prices and I would price mine right in the middle. So just to round off numbers, you know, one guy gets $50 for the grill, another guy gets $150 for the grill. I see that, I drop mine right in the middle, 100 bucks. It worked, you know, the average works. Um, One of the techniques that I would use, and this, I tell you the truth, I probably made more money this way than I did any other way, okay? When you were dealing with common, when you were dealing with, with oddball oil, I lost that bolt. I left that bolt inside. Remember the bolt I showed you before? How do you value a bolt like that? How do you price a bolt like that? Or any trinket for that matter, you know? The, let's say the, the, the spring that holds the headlight bucket, you know, against the adjuster or something along those lines. How do you price something like that? What I would do is, people would want, want ads in these, you know, uh, in, the, in these uh, forums. And what I would do is, I would respond with a picture of the part that I had, and I would say, whatever shipping would happen to be on it, if it was a small item, you know, $3 shipping, if it was a big item, $20 shipping, whatever it happened to be, and we're gonna get into shipping in a minute. Um, I would say, shipping is gonna be, you know, five bucks. Send me whatever you think it's worth, right? Or send, I'm sorry, I would say, send me whatever you think is fair. Right? That's important. You have to word it that way. Send me whatever you think is fair. All right. So here's what would happen. Somebody would run an ad. I'm looking for you know a grill for a 69 dart, and five people would jump in there and say, I got one. You know, 95 bucks. I got one. 160 dollars. Right. And so on and so forth. When I would respond with, I've got one. Send me whatever you think is fair. Most people are very fair-minded, and what they'll do is, if they like the grill and they, they know your reputation as a good seller, they'll send you. They won't they won't try to lowball you. They'll actually send you what they think is fair. And most people that I found, 90% of the people you come across that you deal with, are fair-minded people. So I would say, so somebody would say, looking for you know the bolts, the hold-down bolts for the, my rock arms for a small block, and I would say. I've got them, I've got the bolts and the washers, I'd send them a picture, I'd say, shipping is gonna be five bucks, send me whatever you think is fair. And usually they'll send 25 or 30 bucks, because they understand. Yeah, I had to take that engine apart, I had to, you know, I had to, I had to go buy it, I had to store it, I had to take it apart, I had to, and I'm gonna have to package it. So they take that into consideration. Same thing like with those fuel pump bolts, you know, send me whatever you think is fair. And most people will realize, well, you know, this guy knows his stuff. I have faith in that, you know, he's, he's sending me the right thing. You know, it's worth 30 bucks to me. And they'll send you 30 bucks for the bolts. You're not, you're, you're getting super top dollar for, you know, a bolt. But you earned it, you know, and most people recognize that and most people are more than happy to send you that money because they know down the road they're gonna do business with you in the future. I think you get the general idea, right? Shipping. Shipping was a big one. Let's go back to the house. Before we talk about shipping parts, I gotta show you this because this is like a really good example of how you can be creative and turn, you know, something that, you know, a parts car, no matter what it is, you can make some money off of it. This is an example, this is just a more part example. On these cars, the firewall stamping is different from an AC car to a non-AC car. So this car originally had AC, okay? So now you've got guys out there who are putting these cars together that didn't originally have AC, but they want to put the factory AC system in it. They need this section of firewall to do it. They'll pay 75 to 100 bucks for this piece of firewall. And conversely, you've got guys who had AC cars like this one, they want to make it factory non-AC, so they need the section of non-AC. So it's like, if you know the cars, you know the market, right? You know all of the little ins and outs of it, that, you, you know, I'm going to make money off that piece of sheet metal one way or the other. And, so, and you know, you got stuff like these inner fenders, right? So they sell reproduction inner fenders. They sell the whole stamping and it's like 250 bucks, whatever it happens to be. But you got guys who don't want to replace their entire inner fender. It's, it's, it's a major deal to replace one of these. There's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of, it's, it's integrated into a lot of the structure. So 
you take an inner fender like this. Somebody needs a section right here because it was crashed or because it's rusted. You know, this is worth 50 bucks. Somebody needs this section here because these are common to rot through or crunch in an accident. There's another, you know, 60, 75 dollars. Very common on these cars, they had a lot of people put fender wall headers on them and they cut these sections out. So when you go to put this back together again, if you don't want to change the whole section, you know, the whole, the whole inner fender, and you just want to fix the damage, there's 75 bucks right there. And somebody's happy to pay that for it. You know, it's very common that underneath the flange on these, like this one here actually happens to be rotted. Um, underneath the flange, if you have a good flange, there's a $60 piece of metal because it's far easier to change just this than to change the whole thing. You really got to use your head and know your market. But for you guys who are doubting, like, oh, how can you possibly make $15,000 off of a, you know, rusty, banged up, you know, 74 duster? Well, that's how. And, you know, you also have to realize that these sections here fit not just this car. This section is from 1967 to 1976. There are tens of thousands of cars out there that this applies to. That's how you make money with this stuff. And then there's shipping. And shipping is a deal breaker on a lot of sales, right? Two things you should never underestimate, right? The power of focus and the creativity of an Italian on a mission. I figured it all out. I circumnavigated every shipping avenue there possibly is. I've exploited every loophole there is. And there's a lot of stuff I've got to keep secret. But there's a few things I can share with you. The U.S. Postal Service is your best friend. And I'll explain these things in a minute. But I sent things through the mail that should never be able to go through the mail. Have you ever shipped a complete rear end or complete rear axle assembly through the mail? I have dozens of them. Here's how you do it. You break it down. The axle, the, okay, so the postal, the postal Service has a 70 pound weight limit, okay? So if you strip down a rear end, the housing, I've, I've yet to come across a housing, you know, a car housing, that weighed more than 70 pounds. The N60 is an, ex, an exception. But the common housing, the eight and three quarters and the eight and a quarters and all of that, uh, they come to under 70 pounds. That gets wrapped in cardboard. The axles get wrapped in cardboard and sent in another box. And the guts go in a large flat rate box like this one. Now, here's, here's what you gotta know about working with these flat rate boxes. Okay, um, this one is this one is probably the most versatile of them all. The large, long flat rate. Now, here's what you need to know about these. They'll ship anything as long as it's under 70 pounds, and it fits within the corners of the the, the stock, the original folds of the box. So this thing could be bulged out literally, okay, like like this, right? And as long as you can get the ends to seal, right, it goes. How good are these things? I could take this 66 pound 426 Hemi head, give it a wrap in cardboard so that all of the sharp edges are, you know, are, are dull. Then slip it inside of this box and send it any place on earth that has a USPS zip code for 20 bucks, for less than 20 bucks. I could send a pair of 426 Hemi heads anywhere, you know, like I said, anywhere in the world that has a zip code, 20 bucks, 40 bucks for the, for the pair. And of course, you would send the valve springs and everything else in another, you know, a smaller flat rate box, uh, you know. So at any rate, you get the general idea. Intake manifolds, no problem. What I would do with the intake manifolds is, oh, when you do something like this, when you, when, you, when you overstuff one of these boxes, again, very important that it doesn't move around inside the box, and then you take this box and you laminate it with packing tape, right? Two layers, and it turns it into an indestructible, you know, vessel to carry your goods wherever they have to go. Um, these boxes here, you just send eight and three quarter center sections. Uh, an eight and three quarter center section weighs about 74 pounds. But if you take the yoke off of it, you take the bolts off of it, and you can stick it into one of these boxes, and they bulge out at the top like crazy. But again, you, you're folding it in at the four corners, they'll ship it. It comes to 69 pounds with those items off of it, and then you send those other items in a smaller package. These bags are great, okay? As long as the bag is, is, you know, as long as it fits inside the bag, they send it. 
They don't care what you do to the bag, as long as it's inside the bag. Well, if you take this and you heat it with a heat gun or even a hair dryer, you can expand them greatly. It goes, you know, it's the loopholes. This is what you have to, you know, the creativity of it. Cardboard, uh, you, you're gonna go, if you're gonna do this, you're gonna go through a lot of cardboard. Find a furniture store. They've got more than they know what to do with. They fill dumpsters with the stuff. All the packing material you need is free. Cardboard, bubble wrap, styrofoam, uh, you know, foam wrap, all of that stuff. We used to just go and, and, and fill the trunk up with it, you know, once a week or so, and then that's it. You never pay for packing materials. Even the tape, you know, you go get the tape over at the Dollar Tree. We used, I used to go to the Dollar Tree. They used to piss people off. I used to go to the Dollar Tree and just buy all of their tape. You know what I mean? Or the Dollar, yeah, Dollar Tree. And just buy all of their tape. I just, however many, you know, you got, you got 60 rolls, no problem. Yeah, I'm taking them. And uh, that's how you do it. You've got to be creative. There are ways to ship everything. But that was a big edge of mine, you know, the fact that I will get it to you. I think the only parts I never, I never sent, you know, through the mail was like I never sent an engine block through the mail. Uh, crankshafts are no problem because they, they all come in on the Chrysler. They all come in under 70 pounds. I never sent like a full hood, but I've sent, you know, sections of hood. I believe, yeah, pretty much so. The only part that I've never sent USPS is an engine block. So I think you guys get the general idea. Uh, you know, usually at the end of these videos, I, you know, I say, you know, I hope you got something out of that, right? But this time around, you know, I know you got something out of that. So, that's it. You know, hard work. It's, it's not easy. We focus on this business 12 hours a day, 7 days a week, you know, year round. It was never a day off. There was ever, you know, an hour off. But you know what? I tell you. I was able to build a bunch of cars from, from the, the leftovers, you know. Uh, in fact, we built a whole car out of stuff that just wasn't nice enough to sell. This is a way that you can turn your hobby, maybe not into a, maybe not into a full-time business like we did, but it's definitely a way that you can make your hobby pay for itself. So uh, that's it. I'll see you tomorrow. And tune in next time when I tell you how to make a living off of YouTube.